Conway. Today you are about to listen to an episode with myself and Kelly Baker. Kelly Baker punched her first ticket to the CrossFit Games this year in 2023 out of North America West. Um, She finished 10th there. And essentially, uh, she's got a background that many of you may not be familiar with. She's been to the CrossFit Games in 2016. She's been to the Games in in 2022. Uh, Both of those were on a team, and she even qualified a third time in 2020. And of course, we know that as the COVID year, Um, her team appearances were top 20 finishes. And she's got quite the background within our space. She's a former Division I athlete where she played soccer. And in this particular interview today, we dive into her execution at semifinals, what it was like the moments there waiting on the competition floor, not knowing if she did enough to punch her ticket to Madison or not. Uh, She went into test number seven in a pretty strong place. She was in seventh overall. But she certainly had a performance that she did not expect. And we get into detail about that um, with Test 7. So it led to a bit of anxiousness and anticipation there for many, many minutes, which seems like an eternity um, on the competition floor at her stall mat waiting to find out if she were going to the CrossFit Games or not. Um, We would, of course, find out that that was true. And we dive into discussion about her training leading forward in the next seven weeks, um, what this last year has looked looked like for her in regards to uh, getting married. Uh, setting setting time aside um, for that freedom to focus on enjoying that process. Her sister got married. She got a new coach. There are a lot of things to catch up with with Kelly. And one of the more interesting topics is that she uh, began her professional career as a teacher for seven years, where she taught uh, elementary school students and now has made the switch to full-time nutrition as she is a nutrition coach herself and has overseen many athletes throughout the years and has uh, eventually uh, created a really uh, great space for a demographic of only really working with performance-focused athletes uh, to such a high level that, of course, she's got a waiting list. If you want to work with her, uh, you can find out more about that within our episode. But We talk about mindset. We talk about social media. um, We talk about expectations. We talk about so much that really is enveloped in the life of an athlete and particularly a high level performer like Kelly, who has had it uh, within her radar for many years to be at the CrossFit Games, but not always an individual. So this is a new experience, new pressures and new perspectives. I will hold you up no more. But before I let you go and dive into this episode, I want to remind you, Please subscribe to our channel and share your favorite episodes with friends. And don't be afraid to reach out at Adrian Conway underscore on Instagram specifically. And let me know who you want to hear from on other episodes and what you want to hear about in these athletes lives. We're looking to bring you guys some value and of course, grow uh, the fans perspective of who these athletes are within their lives, as well as enrich the experience that we're all going to get in just a couple months to watch them at the CrossFit Games. Enjoy this episode. Today, I am joined by Kelly Baker. Kelly, you have officially punched your ticket to the CrossFit Games as an individual Mm -hmm. for the very first time finishing 10th in North America West. Talk to me about how you're feeling and what that experience was like when you were on the competition floor just, what, about, I don't know, 12 days ago or so, it seems like. Yeah. Um, It was the goal right after games last year. I'd qualified with a team. And I just said to myself, you know what, it's always been in my heart that I want to be out there on the floor as an individual. And I haven't really given myself the opportunity to do it or really go for it. And, you know, I spoke with my now husband that it would be a lot of sacrifice on both sides. And um, he was like, go all in, let's do it. So I, you know, cut down my clients. I got a new coach. I, um, I just, you know, really try to give myself the best opportunity that I could. And I think it paid off. I had a really great kind of off season with online qualifiers with um, TFX. And then, um, you know, I, not that I'm disappointed in a 10th place finish, but the last event didn't really go as planned. And, you know, I went from seventh to 10th, but I, the goal was to make it. So I'm just, you know, I was really grateful that I did enough in the other six events that I could have a little bit of a catastrophe and, and still get there. So. Yeah, that's right. You you handled business pretty darn well throughout the course of the weekend. In fact, I was there. I had some athletes competing on the floor, and then I was doing some coverage for the CrossFit Games podcast. And, um, you know, I noticed that you were very consistent in your execution. You know, you seem to be putting together um, what I would consider, uh, you know, a very not necessarily polarizing right not like you're you were out there stacking ones and twos throughout the course of the weekend but it was very consistent across the board when you compared it to the field and the points that you were able to amass now you refer and make a reference to specifically uh, test seven 
Was there something that took place in test seven? And for those that don't know, you guys were hitting 10 calories uh, on the echo bike. Then you were hopping up for 20 toes to bar. And then you were carrying a 150 pound sandbag about 60 feet or so approximately maybe yep, 90, 60, 90 yeah. feet, something like that for yeah. three, three rounds for time. So yeah. this was a very like, yo, get onto the floor, not quite selling your soul to the bike, but it can't be too slow either. Take a yeah. chance on the toes to bar. And then of course, grip it and rip it on that sandbag. Was there something about that test that limited you or was it more of an execution falter on your part? No, um, it was actually the one workout from the weekend that I was most confident in. And wow. Then, okay. Yeah. So I, think I do a pretty good job. You kind of mentioned it before how I was just pretty consistent. I would say that's just who I am as an athlete. Um, I don't really feel like I have any home run hits, but I don't know if I have anything that's going to completely push me into a hole. Um, but when the workouts got released and we tested them, tested them from as much information that we had, um, it was the one that I was most confident in. So when we got to the last event, my coach had said, you're making games unless a catastrophe happens <laughs> and a catastrophe did happen. So I almost didn't make games, but um, I think I, the, my one regret that I have is that I was paying attention to too much around me during the event mm. and I didn't have my blinders up and I usually do a good job at that. Um, I had, I just should have recognized I was in the top heat at that moment. You know, everyone was pushing hard, but I was, maybe two seconds behind everyone else getting off the bike and for some reason that put me in a sense of panic like I needed to go fast um so the last bike I really gave it all I got I think I was basically neck and neck with the two girls on either side of me so I was right where I needed to be but I still had this kind of internal dialogue saying you were supposed to do really well in this workout you were supposed to be winning this workout and I you know, thought, you know what, the sandbag isn't that heavy for me. Let's just grip it and <laughs> and try to run with it in that last round. And I did that. And I think my feet moved faster than, you know, I really wanted to with the sandbag in front of me. And the sandbag fell and then I fell. And when I finished that event, I was like, I, it's over. Like, mm. there's no way I'm getting in. I knew kind of what place I needed to be in. I think I needed to take like a 21st or something like that in order to no matter what I was going right. to make games and I knew that I wasn't going to be 21st or better at that point and I knew the girls behind me had did pretty well um so after that had happened everyone I don't know if like fans or people that weren't at the event can really see but people just watching online it just looks like the event happened they go to a little commercial break and then they start announcing it but what they don't really see is like all of us athletes are then told to get back on our start mat and then we just wait and we're waiting there. And I look over at my coach and I'm almost like, can you do some math for me? You know, like I just felt like a sitting duck and, you know, he was doing as best he could. But I, I really do think he probably thought I was out. I yeah. thought I was out. But I think even talking to like even talking to Brian Friend after like a lot of people were saying like, yeah, we, we had you out like you were we the points were so close. Um, I mean, I, I think the stat is if I was a quarter of a second slower, Danny would have tied me and then the tiebreaker would have went to her because she had a higher rank in one of the other events. So, right. yeah, I don't know. Sometimes the ball falls on your side and it did that day. So it was it made it for a more dramatic ending, I guess. Oh my goodness. It, it made it for a dramatic ending to say the least. And yeah, folks, if you're listening to this and you haven't been to a, a semifinal or regional competition in person, you know, what Kelly is describing is, is literally feels like an absolute eternity mm -hmm. when you are on the cusp of qualifying for perhaps a CrossFit Games, let alone your first, let alone like understanding that you were in a position, okay, I've got some ownership over this. Yeah. All I got to do is handle my business. And then you felt like you, of course, you know, uh, no pun intended, let the ball slip a little, right? Yeah. Um, for you, you hit on several key aspects there that, I, that I'd love to kind of sit on just a little bit. And the first one is that, you know, you mentioned that as an athlete, you tend to put your blinders on. In our space, we've got people who swear up and down that they look to the left and look to the right, and that's who they compete and how they compete. And then there's folks like you where you say, okay, I'm better off if I focus solely yeah. on my lane and focus solely on my capacity and then just execute to the highest of my ability. Is this something, Kelly, that, that you came into our space with mindset-wise? Was this developed over time or was it taught to you? 
Uh, I guess I would say developed over time. I usually do really well on online qualifiers um, and I really don't leaderboard. So I do my best to not look at what other people have done because I feel like that always has set some sort of marker of like, I don't know, let's say um, Tia. No, I mean, I'm not, not saying I would ever reach her, but let's say she only did six rounds or did six rounds in some sort of workout. It's like in my mind, I'm human that I would say, well, that would put me probably around four and a half or five rounds. I would always put a limit on what I was capable of based on what someone else had done. Mm. And then once I kind of stopped doing that, I started doing really well on online qualifiers. The Open last year, I did really well in. And then this year with Open quarterfinals, just to say like, I'm going to do what's best for me. And even looking at people's approach, I'm not someone that's going to go 21 ring muscle-ups unbroken into something. I'm pretty good at transitions. I'm pretty good with small sets with quick rest. Um, so I've just kind of realized if I play my game, I'm going to do what's best for me. I've, I've definitely taken the bait before where mm. someone else went and I probably shouldn't have went yet or kind of reverse where someone else went. And I, I did this actually a little bit on event four um, or sorry, event six where someone else went and I didn't go because they went and I felt like I'm supposed to trail a little bit behind mm. um, in event six. It was the, you know, the legless rope climb and, and I'm really good at them. And um, my best movement is handstand pushups. So even when I was upside down on my handstand pushups, I think I was in third in our heat. I think um, Alex and maybe Bethany were both on the wall as well. And I was at a 10 or 11 and I was just like, I'm just going to do the 20 unbroken. I was okay. And then I kind of heard the announcer saying how Bethany and Alex, had both came off the wall and I came off the wall too. And I came off out of like a security blanket purpose, maybe. Sure. Um, but I also knew that that workout was very easy to get trapped in and I knew I needed to do well enough. So coulda, shoulda, woulda, and maybe it would have smacked me in the face if I didn't come off the wall. Um, but even with the legless, I kind of went up. And then I saw me and Alex were kind of at the same spot and I almost waited for her to go just to see what she, what was going to happen. And then I felt like, okay, I can go too. when really, if, if it wasn't in the, if I wasn't in the position that I was where I just needed to be okay um, and just qualify, maybe I would have taken a risk there, but yeah, it's just, I think I'm just one of those athletes. I just need to, I know myself well enough that it's too easy to get trapped in. Um, and you saw it this, you know, this, even with Europe, with Sarah and, um, you know, even a couple of girls, uh, in our, um, in our semi that kind of got stuck on the rope and you're just like, damn, they're just slowly slipping away from that qualifying spot. So, uh, it can be really heartbreaking to watch. So I just, I didn't want to be that end of it. Yeah. It's, it's such an interesting consideration. Um, you know, what you're doing right now is doing a great job at describing Kelly, how, there's a there's a sport within our sport. A lot of people watch what we do as high level CrossFitters or at the CrossFit Games or at semifinals. Heck, even regular affiliate members watching their people do quarterfinals, and everyone's just like, "Kelly, why aren't you going? Kelly, go!" You know, they're rooting their face off. It's only three minutes into a twelve minute workout. <laughs> yeah. They don't quite understand the pacing that is necessary and the self awareness also that's necessary to execute at a really high level. And I, I love that you're kind of being honest and sharing this where it's like, it, it, because I've been there myself. Okay, cool. I've got this game plan. These are my expectations for this test. And I go out and I'm feeling pretty good. But then Ben Smith made a different choice in me. And so I was like, uh oh, feeling a little insecure about yeah. my fitness and my choice because, well, he crushed me in the open or mm -hmm. he, he crushed me in the last test or whatever it was. And all of a sudden then I'm doubting and I've got to either combat that doubt with like positive self-talk and like, no, I'm going to stick to the plan. Or maybe it's a look at my coach in the stands to like reassure me, like, go, 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 or wait, wait, wait. Mm -hmm. But my goodness, there's so many things that we've got to consider. Um, and I appreciate you sharing that because I think it brings it to life for a lot of, not just people that support us as athletes or support you and your family through friendships or whatever it is, but people who just watch our sport as a whole, because I don't think that they see much past our rowing intervals and our absolute one rep maxes and the capacity that we've got. And they think, well, just because you can 
means that you should. And we all know at this point, especially for you being such an experienced competitor, um, that just because you can certainly doesn't mean that you should. And sometimes yeah. timing is important. Um, how, in regards to these lessons, because you're piecing them together, even at this semifinal that we're speaking through, you know, you mentioned, of course, test seven, you mentioned test six, um, which was very high skill. A lot of athletes, um, specifically on the women's side, got really trapped in that little section where it was like, cool, legless, strict handstand pushups, legless again uh, in that little window. How are you taking these lessons and trying to think ahead, apply them to the CrossFit Games, apply them to the next seven weeks, where now you've got an opportunity to kind of refine some weakness, refine your psyche, and then take the floor to do the best that you can out there? Yeah, I was just talking to my coach about this, actually, and we were saying how it just seems very trendy of kind of what the programming has been like. It's been mm. really skilled, even in the open. Like, we had yep. wall-facing handstand push-ups to end. It's been really skilled and also, like, bottleneck skilled where you can do really well, but if you bite off more than you can chew, you can get trapped at some point. And I felt like that happened a lot in, you know, in semifinals, it was just really hard to take certain risks. Um, so just to follow the trend of programming, it seems like games will be heavy and high skilled and kind of finding a spot in that workout where let's see who goes for it and can execute, but we might see some people get really stuck. Yep. Um, so yeah, I, I don't know. It's just been, yeah, it's, I'm excited for games training and just, we just have no idea what to expect. So um, it should be pretty interesting. Oh my goodness. You, you think it's going to be so entertaining. You know, I can't wait. I've, I've, uh, I'll be out there covering it in some degree. I don't know exactly what commentary role I'll have, but I'll be out there whether it's on the floor with you guys after you finish events or if it's, you know, talking about, of course, what you're doing while you're on the floor. And um, I mean, my excitement is through the roof. And a lot of it is because now that we've seen Boz program for a full year, we're starting to get an idea. Like you mentioned, Kelly, we're starting to get it. Not necessarily that we know his flavor because I wouldn't dare to pretend to be arrogant enough to say such a thing. Yeah. Because yeah. then, of course, then it's going to kick us all in the teeth. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But it is, like you mentioned, um, there have been a lot of holdups for particular athletes, whether it's skill set or whether it's strength. And then it does seem as though even when you feel like, OK, this workout I can actually lean into and go, go, go. Um, there's this risk component that's always inherent. And we talk about that like in test uh, test seven. Right. Where it's like, that's a fast workout. There are a lot of folks that punch their ticket to the CrossFit Games where it's like, cool, no problem. 20 toes to bar, easy day. Carrying that weight of a sandbag, no problem. But then it was like, what is your threshold speed there? And it's going to come down to seconds. So if you drop the ball, you fumble the ball, you reach failure for some reason on the toes to bar, right? Anything could have happened. And then, you know, this takes me to a highlight of your weekend, which was test five. Um, you executing the eight, the eight touch and go snatches and then having a great performance on the runner. Um, but that was also one where it was like, okay, yes, everyone pretty much understands you're going to do eight touch and go, but then like, what pace do you settle in on this runner? Are you confident enough to start fast enough to be relevant? Or are you going to have, have these insecurities and start too fast? And then guess what? You know, 60 seconds into this 800 meter run, your pace just peters off, which I saw so many athletes do. Right. Mm -hmm. So talk about the, the, the test that, what did you finish on that test? Can you remind me? Do you remember what that I was? I think it was fifth. Yeah. I want to say it was a top five for sure. Um, what was your mindset going into that one, knowing that it was short, seize the moment type opportunity. And then of course I got to ask it, have you, is, are you a runner by trade? Is this something that you brought into your background and knew, okay, this one's in my back pocket. I'm hitting a home run here. Yeah. Uh, I ran track in high school, so I actually ran the 800. There we go. Uh, that and the 400 meter hurdles. So I don't know if there's any two worst races out there. I also have done there's, two There's not. Yeah. <laughs> I've done uh, two marathons before. And um, so I, I thoroughly enjoy running. Um, but it's funny you say that, like, of course, everyone's going to go touch and go. I actually, in practice, did them singles uh -huh. as fast as I could. And I was about four seconds faster. Wow. Uh, with singles. And I was just watching and waiting to see if any is anyone going to yes. be ballsy and go for it because yeah. i think for the most part we all were going pretty fast on the touch and go but in a sense i think in the back of our minds like that wasn't the fastest eight touch and go i've ever done knowing i was going right into an 800 
No doubt. So the less time under tension when I did singles, because the barbell was light enough that you didn't have to have perfect hand placement, right? You could, depending on athlete, but I could do a single drop and just kind of grab the bar and just, and kind of get the work done. So I was much faster at it doing singles in practice, but again, I don't know if I was ballsy enough to just be the one. Um, and I did say there was a little bit of room for error. Like if, if you get a bad bounce on that and your hands sure. aren't on the bar anymore, that I was like, I don't know if that's really, if the risk is worth a reward, but um, yeah, for that one, I just, I wanted to win that event. I was, you know, I was like, you know, I, fuck it. I love that. I can just go out and this is just grit and gut. And yep. that's, yeah, it was, it was definitely a fun one. I would have loved if it was like a foot race. I know that, you know, we, we use the runners and that's fine and things like that, but um you saw kind of what happened or maybe the rumor of what happened with calibrations and things like that. And we have three runners at our gym and all three are different. So not saying that they aren't all the same, but it would have just been fun to be able to go shoulder to shoulder with some people and kind of play that game too. Oh, you, and, and, you know, again, you're, you're leading me down these rabbit holes that I kind of want to go down to, but I got to tread lightly. Otherwise no, we'll be, stuck in, this, we'll be stuck in these holes for, uh, <laughs> for several minutes on end before we continue to advance. But I think, you know, the one thing that you're mentioning there about the singles is my goodness, we've got to continue to think outside of the box, right? As coaches and as athletes, it's like, and we've got to be willing to be the one set apart. Yeah. Like, yo, people are going to think this is stupid and like, good for them. Watch me, watch me walk them down on this yeah. 800, 800 meter run. Right. Like, and, and I love that because so, you know, with, with the athletes that I had going, um, to the semifinal, a lot of them, it was their very first time ever qualifying. Like they were, you know, we're talking deer in the headlights, seeing all their favorite CrossFit athletes be there yeah, with them. Yeah. Right. And part of our preparation was that we did, we did singles also. Now we did singles and then we also did like 90 foot shuttle runs for the 800 instead of the runner because i was like no way no way we're running that that won't be even as cool not nearly as cool right yeah and unfortunately we did run and it was an erg and we got to do what we got to do yeah, right? yeah like we're we're all compliant enough and understand like hey we'll fall in line here we're going to take the test the best that we can um but i especially if it was going to be shuttle runs i was like it is not worth it to go touch and go because the ground that you can make up in the time that's provided for the run and particularly if you need the power to change direction several times like you'll make that up don't ever worry about you know being touch and go and to hear that you did a similar thing in training and still even made up a better time on the runner itself because it, of course the resiliency in your hamstrings was was better you were more firm throughout all your strides like your running was just more powerful and yeah. because you spent so much more time on the runner than on those eight touch and go. I just think I appreciate you sharing that. Cause again, it's like people have to always be willing to experiment in ways that we're not actually seeing, especially when it comes to progressing our sport, right? Like mm -hmm. we always assume that the touch and go is going to be the fastest method. And sometimes that's not always the case. Um, I think we kind of saw that with, I, I want to say almost every single time the first person on the runner didn't win. So you know, that was kind of, I try to take that from looking at the East of, okay, even if I'm not going to go singles, then I'm going to breathe and really control myself during the eight because they're four or three seconds are not going to pay off um, unless you have just some stud runner next to you. But um, yeah, so I, I would have been curious to have seen someone do it. And I don't know, maybe I should have done it, but either here or there. <laughs> yeah, it's you know hindsight's always twenty twenty, right? Yeah, exactly. And and you, and you learn, and you you're able to to call audibles. And he, the, you know the crazy thing about our sport is that we're, we're both sitting here like, yeah, you know, well next time you get that kind of opportunity, and it's like we may never do that test again. Yeah, <laughs> you yeah, know, we just exactly. may never. Yeah, yeah. We may never get another opportunity, and that's of course what is unique about what we do. Um, I will say, you know, the one thing that I was dreaming up as I watched this test, specifically four and five back to back take place is I'm like, man, wouldn't it be so cool if Boz is taking the analysis from these, these data points, like how fast athletes are running the eight and how heavy they're snatching in test four and they're combining and getting ready for something really cool for us to watch at the CrossFit yeah. games, right? Whether it's like a more high, a highly, uh, 
you know, uh, or a heavier load that would be prescribed and maybe even some type of buy-in time for the run. Mm -hmm. Right. So now it's like, we think if you've done this in the past, he's like, cool, maybe it's going to be 800 meters in X time. Then you have three minutes or two minutes to get max reps at this. But if you don't make the time cap of the run, you don't, you get, don't to play. get to play. You don't get yeah. to play at the barbell. Right. Yeah. Like, wow, that would be cool. So I was just, while I was sitting there and even doing commentary, I was like, Oh man, what if this is a thing? That'd be so cool. I would, yeah. I would be so fired up to see the translation of that data and those numbers and, you know, CrossFit, Hey, we're, we're quantitative, right? We, we want to be measurable, observable, and repeatable in the way to continue to push even our day-to-day -day members. So I think that could be really fun. Um, yeah, for sure. But Kelly, you've mentioned a few times that, you know, you've got a coach, you've got people in your corner, you've even made a transition. Can you tell me a little bit about um, the team that you got behind you right now that's overseeing like your guidance as an athlete and what it's been like in the in the time that that you've made a switch? Yeah. So um, even when I got interviewed right after I'd qualified, um, the question was like, you must be so proud you you've fallen it's been so many years that you've like fallen short or something like that. And I just want to say to people like, not really. I just didn't go this route. I just didn't go individual route. And I do right. think team doesn't really get as much praise. To be honest, I prefer going out as an individual. It sometimes hurts a little bit less. I know some people don't think it is, but you get to decide on how you're going to break it up or how you would want to do it. And once, you know, when you're with a team, it's like, if we've all decided we're going for 20 unbroken, it's like, even if you think 10 hold on the shoulder five would be better. And it's like, nope, you just got to suffer because we came up with that. So um, anyway, the team that I have now uh, in, I guess it was September when I kind of said to myself, you know what, I really want to give individual a go and spoke to my now husband about it. You know, I knew we had big things coming this year. We were getting married. We were going to have a honeymoon. My sister, who's you know my absolute best friend in the world was getting married. Um, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, how I'm so grateful I had those things this year. But hey, this uh, was a big parents. I just want to lean in. And <laughs> yeah. Big year. Yeah, shout for out the parents to over there. <laughs> shout out to the parents. Two weddings, one real. year. <laughs> weddings are no joke, bro. They're not. Um, so I was just also kind of saying, okay, who do I want as a coach? And I had some people in mind that I thought, you know, I could you know, be, I'm not going to name names, but under that title, under this title of, of different companies, I guess you could say, but I knew if I was going to give it my all, I really wanted someone to be a part of the ride with me. That was, it was going to mm -hmm. feel personal too. Mm -hmm. And, um, one of the coaches at my gym that I go to now, um, I just feel like he never really got the opportunity to have a high level athlete, but he's such a nerd. He's super smart. I know he knows what he's talking about. And he's so invested and would be so invested with me. And so I just kind of said to him, like, we can be a team with a dream. Like, do you want to kind of go on this journey with me? And, and since day one, he's showed up to every single training session I've had. And, um, you know, he listens to probably every podcast that's out there on CrossFit, just gets as much data as he can. And um, I'm just super grateful that to have someone so invested in me. And I just really want it to be one of i think he ended up he actually ended up having five individuals at semifinals and one team at semifinals and the t his team made it to games and um the other semifinal athletes did really did really well um so yeah i don't have like a huge team i don't have a running coach or things like that but yeah. he's just been kind of everything i could have asked for in a coach and but just i think the biggest thing is having a support system and like i said my husband knows kind of what what he got himself into and this sport is not just physically demanding but it's so emotionally taxing um you know i i get home a lot of the time this week just in particular it's the first week truly back into training and i've just been kind of emotional i was mm. it's really nice to kind of see other athletes be so vulnerable i think ariel lowen put out a story yesterday just talking about she just didn't want to be in the gym and she was like it's just one of those days where i just don't want to be here and that that's it's okay and we all know it every one of us athletes do that but we rarely put it out there it's kind of maybe what we put on instagram was wanting to show the world that we're tough and you know put some sort of cockiness that we're you know have the swagger and we're going to do great and we can't wait for games and the reality of it is that it's really hard the training is emo really emotional and physically demanding and 
to have someone just be so supportive at home, like whether it's just getting home and they've already cooked dinner, or, you know, they're okay that they're, they're, they're weighing, weighing your rights out for you. It's, it just makes the transition of being selfish, not feel so selfish, which is really nice. Yeah. And I, you know, it's interesting that you bring this up. I, I didn't even have the intentionality of really like talking a ton about it, but I know with any games athlete, it's important to discuss and there's a balance of it all. But a lot of folks that, that may not understand this is that they see your life and they're like, wow, I would love to have that. She just gets to work out so much and she gets to do this and do that. And I think that there's a gap in understanding that, you know, working out is amazing. Working out is fun. Working out with intentional outcomes and expectations is hard mm -hmm. and it's trying and there's pressure and there's people that you don't want to let down and there's mm -hmm. right. And the list goes on to be quite frank. There's sacrifices that you're making. There are things that you're not attending there. There's all these things. And so w with that being the case and, and you mentioning like, yeah, you know, it's, it's a bit emotional referring to Ariel Lowen. I, I just didn't want to be in the gym. You've now punched your ticket as going to be a rookie as an individual because you've been to the games before. And people might not know this, but in 2016, you were there. In 2022, you were there both on teams. In 2020, you qualified to go on a team, but then didn't get the opportunity. Of course, that was the COVID year. We had some really, you know, strange things going down that year. Um, so your experience within this space is, you know, it's, it's been tenured. Like you've got, you've got a, a ton of experience uh, rubbing shoulders with high-level competitors. How do you, and even from what you've seen other athletes in the space, feel free to, without dropping, dropping names, but mm -hmm. like, what do you see being the most fruitful way of finding balance in this journey? You know, feeling the pressure of qualifying, wanting to punch your ticket, but like keeping it fun, keeping it, uh, this, this passion that it was when you started CrossFit. Yeah. There is a speech that I heard a Val Victorian give that was finishing college and he calls it the 12th second. And he says when he found out his junior year that he was in contention of winning Val Victorian, um, he gave up everything and he said mm. he probably ruined relationships and he, you know, he put everything into getting announced that he's the Val Victorian. Right. And he said, and I get to give this five minute speech, and I get my name called and he said, that's so euphoric for 11 seconds. Mm -hmm. And I, and he said, the biggest lesson I learned is that I want to make sure that in the 12th second, it was all worth it. And that really stuck with me because in, in 2018, in 2016, I went individual at regionals and I took seventh. And so I did what he did. I gave up everything that following year. I ruined relationships and I wouldn't say ruin. I just put them on such a back burner to be super, super selfish. And, and I just didn't have a great weekend. I ended up 13th at regionals that year. And, um, I, be, being and qualifying and making it on teams and things like that have really taught me that it is only euphoric for a really short period of time. So, even with getting my name announced that 10th place spot this year and now my face is on and I'm crying. And it was like, yeah, that felt really awesome, but it wouldn't have been worth it if I ruined my marriage or if I ruined my, you know, my relationship with my family or not going to something that was super important. Like again, my, I had my wedding this year and I, I talked about that a little bit earlier, how I'm so grateful that I had those things because it really kept me in check of my priorities. And I, that are, that's the balance for me that I think is super important that, you know, when a certain time hits, like I'm putting my phone away and being present with my husband when, um, you know, if it's a rest day, like I'm not worrying about CrossFit or things like that. I'm just trying to be, you know, call someone that I haven't called in a really long time or do things that, you know, I don't get to do because of training. And I, that balance for me, I think is going to be worth it because when the last day of the games happens on Sunday. And this is like, a, I guess a hard pill to swallow, but it, the reality is no one really gives a shit anymore about what you've just done. Everyone's now looking forward to well, who do you think is going to win the games next year? Or what's the thing? And um, it's just, it's grounded me a little bit more to recognize that there's a lot more that's bigger than just the season or just me. Um, 
So like I said, my whole goal when after the games or even after semis was just making sure that the 12th second was still really worth it and that I didn't put too many things. I know that we have to have sacrifices, but the things that are even more important to me than CrossFit still had to be up there with CrossFit, um, whether it's family, which is number one priority, but just even the way that I try to treat people or um, it just in general, I think it can be can get to your head really quickly. And, just trying to stay as grounded as I can. So yeah, I'll train my ass off for six to seven hours at the gym. But when it comes time to making dinner and being with my husband, it's like, nope, this is your time. And I owe it to you and to us to be present now. So that's kind of the balance. But I don't know, the next seven weeks, he knows that it needs to take priority. And that's okay, too. So yeah, no doubt about it. And and I would encourage you to just enjoy the grind though, right? Like I think yeah. there, there, there's part of this that's ironic because this is your first chance as an individual. So there's no doubt about it. You're going to think, how many more opportunities will I get like this? Mm-hmm. Um, this is my first time. I want to make the most of it or I want to seize the opportunity for building my business or whatever it is. I mean, all these thoughts were thoughts that I had in 2015 when I punched my first ticket as an individual. And I can say that and I, and I share this with my athletes as well, you've earned such an amazing opportunity to have this purpose-driven training for the next seven weeks that it's ridiculous. You know, Mm -hmm. like think about, uh, there's only 39 other women in the entire world that actually have a purpose in their training that still exists in this calendar year. Everybody else is already dreaming of what can be in 2024. So enjoy the grind, enjoy the, the odd objects and the, the Mm -hmm. swims at the lake or the ocean or wherever Mm -hmm. you are um, getting in the open water or in the pool. Uh, because I think those are those are some of the most fun times. And I know that you know that because being on a team, of course, that's some of the, the biggest fun that I've ever had as well as training with my team in the summer, getting ready for the games themselves. So fun. Yeah. So fun. Um, and, and you've shared a lot. You, you speak with uh, a very clear tone. And I would say like the, the tone of a, a teacher. And that is something that actually you spent a good amount of time doing historically. You said you were a teacher for seven years. Can you share a little bit about what got you into teaching and what what was what age group were you teaching? Yeah, I I think teachers become teachers because they really liked school and I like to get new folders and had notes. But I also had some <laughs> really I had like some really incredible teachers growing up too. I'm really grateful for that. But um, and I always loved kids. I always knew I wanted to have kids and. Um, I just felt really fitting. I, I think I, you know, tried to find a way that I could help people, but I was going to enjoy it. I didn't know if I wanted to do anything in a hospital setting. So anyway, all of these different scenarios. But anyway, I ended up going that route of elementary education and I taught second grade and I taught fourth grade. Um, and it was such an awesome journey. Uh, definitely something I really miss. I don't know if I'll ever go back to it, but I will probably be the best room mom ever to my kids, I think, or, you know, something like that. But eventually I think I'll kind of dive into something a little bit more with kids. Um, But right now I'm just, you know, okay with being full on nutrition coach and keeping that the route. Yeah. And you you mentioned that, which is a great transition to kind of what you do now more full time is your efforts are spent on nutrition coaching. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I want to know kind of how that got how that ball got rolling for you and where your passion and interest came for influencing the nutrition space. But, you know, innately, I think for me, I I see you as an athlete and I see you on social media and I'm like, Oh my goodness. So many women probably come to you and they're like, Hey Kelly, I just want to look like you. So can you give me exactly what I need to do to do that? Right? Like, or how do I make it to the CrossFit games? Is there a way for me to do that within the next six months? You know, people make all these assumptions about you as an athlete, or you in your physical appearance and your capacities that, well, you've got all the answers for them to give them exactly what you have. Right. Um, but let's go ahead and start with how'd you get into this, this influential role that you play right now as a coach? Yeah. So in 2015, right when I kind of started CrossFit is when I met Kelsey Keel and we went team together that year and she had just started working with black iron nutrition. Um, and I didn't really know anything about nutrition at all. I was eating, I think like 1400 calories, something crazy. Um, And I started working with Chrissy May Cagney, who is the owner of Black Iron Nutrition. And she was my first coach. 
And from there, I was just obsessed with learning. I Mm. was like, well, I can, I'm, I'm seeing so many changes to my own body. I thought that was so incredible. I grew up a little bit overweight. I've always been athletic build, but I just didn't, I just didn't have any education on nutrition from, I mean, it's such a disservice, but like in, you know, in school, we don't really learn about macros. We don't learn about calorie intake. We don't learn about the importance of movement. There's just, that would be maybe if I was going to get into something, I would love to maybe do something on just educating because I do think kids want to know. And I think they're, especially kind of where we are right now in our country of, you know, childhood obesity and things like that is no one feels comfortable in their skin, whether you're 10 or you're 50, being extremely overweight and and just not knowing what I'm supposed to do. And I felt that way at a young age or even in high school and being an athlete, even in college. I remember I was a division one soccer player at one point doing the special K diet. Like mm-hmm. I had no idea how to get the a type of body that I was going to be comfortable in. I just had no education on it. And once I started working with Chrissy and, you know, read her book and got so engrossed in so much information that I was so obsessed with this has literally changed my life. I'm so much happier because of it. And I need to find my way into this. And um talking with Chrissy, she was like, want to do an internship? And I started that that next year and I did an internship for a year, got my PN1 and started slowly taking on clients. And then I did that part-time with teaching. And then I was like, you know what? My heart's just not really in it with teaching. And it was Mm. kind of full on to be with, you know, athletes and, or everyday people and kind of changing lives that way. And it's been really fulfilling. So. Wow. That's, that's amazing. And I appreciate the, the fact that it wasn't necessarily something that you were like, oh, cool, I want to coach people. It was the effect that your coaches had on your life mm-hmm. and your performance and your training and your understanding, right? Even self-awareness, self-confidence, all these things. And then it led you to realize that you wanted to have that same type of impact on people. It's interesting because I share a similar uh, experience with coaching. You know, I got into the coaching space just to be a performance-based coach. I wanted to help athletes make it to the NFL and to the NBA and be on the side of traditional sports strength conditioning, essentially. Yeah. And um, when I realized how much I loved CrossFit and competing in the space, and I saw that there were everyday athletes that were investing in their health and really needed guidance and tutelage, then I was like, oh my gosh, I want to do this for other people um, in the everyday sector. When people come to you, Kelly, or is it are you working with predominantly athletes or you can work with the everyday uh, male and female trying to balance their life and career? Like what's your, what's your traditional demographic look like? Yeah. So when I first started, I was primarily just coaching lifestyle is what we call it that route. So that would be an everyday person uh, just wanting to either lose weight, gain weight. It didn't really matter. Um, And then with Black Iron, as the company grew, we decided to go into kind of subdivisions. So there's still lifestyle, but then there's a performance route where, um, which is what I do now. So I work primarily only with athletes. So not just CrossFit athletes, but marathon runners, um, Ironmen, you know, mountain climbers, um, you know, kind of sport you can name, but um, we even have like pregnancy postpartum route. So it's awesome. It's definitely expanded, which is really cool. I will say as much as I love working with athletes, it's it's fulfilling. But as you know, I'm sure if you were to get a, you know, a top level athlete, there's only we're only seeing a little bit of change happening, which is huge. You know, one percent better when you're already that elite is that's we're making huge strides. But when you get someone who just has no idea, if, like me, when I first started out doing a special K diet, right? Um, just tweaking them a little bit. It's so instant gratification for me as a coach when I just can teach someone to change two or three or create two or three new habits that already start changing their lives. And you can just see like a huge difference for them Um, or maybe even getting off a medication or getting to run around with their kids. It's just, that is so fulfilling. So I right now only work with athletes, but there's still a huge part of me that does crave that everyday person. But and and I and I'd love to stick on this topic for a moment. Uh, But what? So when you were working with lifestyle clients, because I literally just gave a a nutrition talk 
at, at a local affiliate here in Salt Lake City, um, just to kind of spur them along, give them some education. There was a new foundational group coming in and the owner of the affiliate was like, hey, would you be interested in coming in to, you know, help help yeah. make, a, make a broad stroke right of the paintbrush there for them? Um, what's, what's the biggest obstacle for lifestyle clients in your experience so far? If you had to assess one thing. What, what in your experience has been the biggest obstacle for people to actually make change that they desire, right? Everyone has these desires and they kind of know what they want, or where they want to go. What's, what's the biggest thing that you've seen hold people back? So many people think it has to do with willpower. Like they'll say to me, well, it's just because you have more willpower than I do. Yeah. And I tell them all the time, that's not the case. I, I personally believe we all have a pretty similar willpower. It's just who's more prepared than the other to make the mm. better choice. Mm. So let's say you, I get home from work and I don't have any groceries at my house and I'm, I've kind of had a long day at work. So there's two people. We both get home from work, had a hard day at work and we walk into our house and one person has no groceries and then the other person has an entire meal already made. So when it decides choosing who's going to order out, there's not much about willpower. Yeah, a little bit, but it's just a harder decision for the person who has no groceries or anything prepared to make a good choice. So I always just think if you can prepare a little bit more, mm -hmm. you're going to make a little bit more or a couple more better choices mm -hmm. than someone else. So it's not so much, I think just, I just more so trying to teach people, we don't have to do meal prep. You don't have to put, rice and chicken in a container to be successful. Right. And I think that's kind of what maybe our world has created in people's minds, but it's just that you have certain things at home that you can make that are still going to be better choices than you constantly ordering out. And I think a lot of people, I mean, I know inflation and grocery shopping can be really expensive, but there is still a way to go about it. That's going to be cheaper than even if you got McDonald's every day. And in the one payment, it's going to be a little bit more expensive, but in the grand scheme of that month, it's going to, you know, still be cheaper. So I think that is one, just the people that are making the better choices don't have more willpower. They're just more prepared. Yeah. And two, a little bit of movement goes a long way. And mm. I think that we think it needs to be grand. I have to go to a gym. I have to like really be hurting for a certain amount of time where I think people really underestimate the value of just getting in some sort of movement each day. Um, so that would be my first two of someone starting out is just creating those habits. And I, and I, and I think you're hitting a nail on the head. It's like, you know, the common saying, if you, if you don't make a plan, then you're planning to fail, you know, yeah. or if you fail to make a plan, then you're planning to fail. And it's um, everybody's journey is going to be different. That's for sure. And I think, you know, you're aware of that. And a lot of our audience is probably aware of that. The, the one thing that I see too, is that, People assume that they can continue to be who they are and then still end up someone very different in a few yeah. months. And I'm like, that's not necessarily how it works. Right. And, and this is, you know, this is a hard teaching, right? I'm not saying this is easy, but people certainly have to be willing to be someone different and make a transformation that's very uncomfortable in regards to how they perceive themselves, the things they do, you know, because other, other, otherwise it's going to be a very hard thing to create these new habits that we're talking about without understanding that they're trying to become something different and someone new. How much then for you, Kelly, is this like not just coaching? You're not just coaching X's and O's, right? We're not like the calling plays for a football team here, or a basketball team. Mm -hmm. This is a very relational experience as a coach. This is very much about emotions and uh, psychological stressors and limitations than it is like literally what people are putting into their mouth. How do you balance that, that, that side of the coaching aspect um, with all the other things that you have going on? Because as a competitive athlete, your wife, um, like there's, there's a lot on everyone's plate, but a coach specifically, it's like your family is almost the whole number of clients that you've got. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that gets complicated. Anybody, everybody listening yeah. got some kind of family, right? And we all yeah, know yeah. how complicated that can be, but relationally that gets trying. How do you find balance there between coach, athlete, and, and all the responsibilities that you carry as a, as a nutrition coach? Yeah, that was kind of because I didn't want to do anyone a disservice. One of the first things I did was kind of cut back my client load. I think at one point I had a hundred clients, which is a lot a month, you yeah, know, no, no and, doubt about uh, it. 
So I think right now I'm kind of sitting around 55 or something like that. So I cut that number in half, which makes it a little bit easier. But um, yeah, I it's it's uh, really interesting being a nutrition coach because half of it is about nutrition and the other half is about, you know, just emotionally being understanding of people's lifestyles and things like that. But I think I do a pretty good job of, you know, kind of putting majority of my clients on rest days so that I'm not spending too much time in the gym um, or I'll yeah. kind of do some work in between the two. But yeah, it's totally not easy, but um, I think we all have something like mine might be a nutrition coaching, but there's some people that, are, that have children that have to, you know, do all of those things. But I think with this sport, it's kind of, it's got to be your full-time job to make it. And I kind of recognized it. So I almost became a part-time nutrition coach, at least during this year. Um, because it's, yeah, it's, it's a lot to coach people. I, I, just like you said, and you know, it's, you know, you're invested in so many people's lives and you want to make sure that you're giving them everything they deserve. So. No, it's, it's, it's so true. And, and you yeah, do have so. to be full-time. Um, and, and yet even for you, uh, you kill it on social media. You got, you got quite the following. I can tell it's very obvious that you put a lot of time and effort into what you do in your presence there. Um, so coaching, social media, performing. In your perspective, how essential is a presence on social media to help be like a driver or catalyst in a career that you've chosen, like coaching and or even competing at a high level? Um, and is it something, is social media something where you're like, cool. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm cool with social media. I like how this flows. It's, it's, it's part of who I am. Or is it like, is it a trying experience for you? Is it difficult? Um, oh, that's a loaded question. When you have sponsorships and things yeah. like that, and there's obligation, yep. sometimes it can be a little bit pressuresome because I want to still be as authentic as I can. Mm -hmm. Um, I personally look at my Instagram as a really cool timeline. Like I, I like really enjoy going back into my Instagram and just saying like, Oh God, I remember that. Or I remember this, or that was a really hard time in my life. Um, and I'm pretty proud of what I've put out to people and being as honest as I can be. But there are times where, you know, you feel like you have to be a certain presence or a certain look. Mm. And, and that has been really difficult. I'll even give the example, you know, right around semifinals at semifinals, I, you know, cut out, drinking entirely for about two months before um just being 100 percent on my macros and there's oh, going sure. to be a payoff of that your body's going to look the best that it's peaked because your training's at its peaked your nutrition's at its peaked and then you get a lot of feedback from people like you look incredible or and which is it's great it's great to hear that feedback too and then you kind of go a week a well-deserved week of eating foods that you don't normally eat and things like that and Maybe I put on two pounds that week or whatever it will be. And I can't help but feel an insecurity of, am I going to look now? Sir? Am I not looking mm. the part? And it's yeah. like, no, I'm just a human being. And I need to remind myself of that too, that in the end, like whatever my body, body fat percentage is, that's not really going to matter to the people that have been following me or really do care about me. It's, they like the person that they see and who I am and my authenticity, but um, the internet can be fucking cruel, man. I mean, the, some of the things that people say, I, I'm pretty lighthearted about it and I'll blast some people that say some extreme things, but it's like, damn, that's, you said that. And that's something that maybe is an insecurity that I've really had. And someone just wants to put it out there that social media does open up a lot of opportunity for people to say something that can, hurt your feelings. And I think it's probably same as you, you have a really big following too. Uh, just this idea of, yeah, I, it's kind of given me like a thicker skin, but at the same time mm. I am human. And maybe when I start a family or something like that, I'll be a bit more protective of what I put out there because someone can say something about me and you know, it is what it is, but that would be really hard if it was something about family or, I mean, I've been really grateful to have people really supportive of my relationship, but I've also had people say things that are negative about maybe my husband or what he looks like or something like that, where I get more offended by that because that's not fair. He didn't choose to be put out into the world. I kind of chose that for him. Sure. Um, 
so yeah, there's so many good and I've met so many amazing people through social media. And, you know, you hear some people say like, you've changed my life in this way or, mm. and, and I just would never know that if they just didn't send that message. Um, but yeah, it's an interesting love hate relationship that I have with it. I'd be curious to your thoughts on that. Oh my goodness. Mine is the, mine is the same. I, I really feel the same way. I think there's, there's some amazing positives that come with social media. And then on the, on the other side, it's there, there's, there, there can be a lot of negatives. And sometimes I even have the perspective on, you know, if, if for me, what I do as a business, whether it was co-founding a supplement business in 2017, or like my coaching business, or even just sharing podcasts, right? But so much of what I do is intertwined within social media. If those things were intertwined with social media, you probably wouldn't see me on it. Yeah. You know, and that's just the the, the harsh honesty. And there are ways to move around it. But again, there, there's some of those positives that I do enjoy. But so much is, you know, I look around at our, our world and society and I'm like, ah, oh, man. It's really hard for us as humans to understand the value or how to apply balance in so many ways. And with social media, because of its addictive properties, it's even worse. And so because of that, it, it, it's hard for me to lift it up too high, um, mm-hmm. although it's, it's certainly created a lot of opportunities for me and my family. Yeah, so yeah. It's, it's a balance. I'm grateful for it. But also, um, you know, I've advised many of my clients to, hey, step away for a while. You know, I, I definitely did that. I was uh, training with Hattie Kanyo, who was also at semifinal. Yep. She moved from Canada to kind of train with me for the season. And uh, it was something both of us decided together. Like we have obligations to post and we'll do that. But you and I, let's just be mentally in it together and let's get off it because it's really, that's the other thing. It can be pretty triggering to see what other people are doing and feel Absolutely. like you're not doing enough. And then I think there's things that I've posted where I look like I crushed this workout and it, maybe I only posted round one of the five and actually I failed at the end. You know, you, you only, people are only putting out what they want to put out. And I think for any athlete, especially anyone that's really struggling with the comparison game would be that is maybe take a step away or Mm -hmm. maybe unfollow. I even say this, like no hard feelings, but if someone's triggering me to feel a type of way, like, Peace. I just, That's right. Just, yeah. Just unfollow. Like there's no reason to start looking at or following certain influencers that have this body type that you've wanted and maybe genetically you'll never be able to reach, but it's always triggering you to kind of doubt yourself or hate yourself or whatever word. And just like, nope, why don't you just follow someone with body positivity and, and go with that. So, um, yeah, I don't know. I think that's kind of how I feel sometimes is I sometimes post pictures and I'm like, I just happened to post the picture where I look the most ripped and that can be triggering to someone else where there's many days. And I try to share that too, that I am so insecure of what I look Mm. like. And I think that's something that could be shared a little bit more as I, even the top athlete, well, you know, top athletes in our sport still deal with the same thing that everyone else is dealing with. And um, that can be really hard. Yeah, it can be hard and, and, and it can also be encouraging to the everyday human that follows us, you know, yeah. like there's, there's a bit of relief they can like, they can take and take this deep breath and be like, oh man, Kelly does that, that too. Me. Thank God. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I'm so glad to see her with a glass of wine in her hand because I, yeah, yeah. you know, like people, people enjoy our, our human side as well. And I think it's important to share that. And and so I gotta, I gotta bring this up too, because we're on the topic of social media, but you have been in the space for quite a while. You're 31, right? 31 mm-hmm. years old. Okay. So from a maturity standpoint, like you, you've been, you've been experiencing a lot of different things within this world. We are now at a place within our space and sport where we're watching teenagers come up from 16, 17 years old with the pressures of social media, with the pressures of sport and competitive nature in mm-hmm. itself, competing against other grown women, established families, established brands, like all this and that. Sponsorships and partnerships are, of course, within the realm of discussion. And it's not just on the female side, but the male side as well. Um, but we've seen athletes like Mal, Haley, like t- they're like, hey, I need some time. I need some space. And yeah. I think about this and I'm like, you know, and, and I'd love to know your opinion on this or your perspective, but I don't know that if social media, if social media doesn't exist or they don't feel the pressures from social media, particularly that they feel that for space is needed. I don't know that 
they feel is seen or is pressured in that way. If they're only just competing with the women they're competing against and then going back to do their training and right, like without that, that peer pressure that exists from social media, I'm not sure if that's as necessary um, or they, that they might not feel that way. What, do, what are your thoughts there? Do you think that that has played an integral role in, in where they're particularly at in their journeys? Yeah, for sure. I also think someone tried to debunk me like the idea and compare it to like, well, NFL players, you know, they have a lot of pressure and you don't see them really pulling out. And I wanted to say to them, I've dated and also hung, I've been friends with people in the NFL and they go and play on Sunday go out and party with their friends Sunday night, have off Monday, Tuesday, kind of get back into training. Our sport is literally who can recover the most. Mm -hmm. It's the most I feel, and I'll say this, maybe people can try to change my mind, but the most physically and mentally demanding sport in terms of it's constant, it's so long our season, Mm -hmm. even in our off season, to make a living here, we need to still be at a high level to compete in other um, places. And all of this is going on where we have to be so spot on with nutrition, our sleep, our stretching, our training, the multiple different routes of training. We're not just one sport that we excel in. It's now we have to be good at swimming and running and weightlifting and gymnastics and the unknown because who knows what the freight they're going to throw at us. That we can't afford if you're a top level athlete to go and have a night out with your friends. And I mean, for someone like Mel, who's so impressive and unbelievably gifted, I do not doubt her at all for what she did or one, she's, you know, living in a different place than her family. Yeah. You know, not really experiencing the things that she might look around in her peers at her age are getting to experience and, and with the whole pressure of the expectation of to win. And mm-hmm. I think that that's really hard. I do think social media plays a huge role in it for sure. Um, but I think there's even more factors of she might look, I don't know if I was her age and look and think, do I want to look back when I'm 90 and I just didn't experience all these things at that age because I had to be, you have to be on top of it a hundred percent or someone else is doing that. Right. And it can be someone that's 26 that already had the experience that you're having at 18 or 19 And, you know, and it's easier for them to give up some of those things because they already got to live that kind of journey. And like I said, I'm so grateful that this year I had my wedding and had my honeymoon because I had to step away. And I would have been so burnt out if I didn't because I felt like I needed to be full on to qualify for games starting in September. That's so long that it built in these mandatory times off for me to just be me and be a wife and, and, you know, even my sister getting married, I just, that was during the open and people had shot me a million messages that I was having a glass of wine in one of my pictures with my sister on her wedding. And I just am like, yeah, it's my, my sister and my best friend in the entire world. And I will still do well on Monday in the open, like back off, you know, and that's where social media can also be a stressor is, you got to be so careful of what you even put out there because then you get feedback of people not agreeing with it or you're not taking your sport seriously. And so, yeah, I don't know. I think maybe the young age being in it for so long, that burnout can be serious with the pressure at a young age, but I think social media plays a role into it. Sorry, that was a lot longer of an answer no. than I think. Yeah, you that's yeah. appropriate. No, that, that's very appropriate. And I, and I seriously appreciate your, your perspective on that big time. That's why I asked the question. So, I, I wanted that type of depth, but it's, you know, it's, it's interesting because for me, it's like the, the rebel, the rebel side of me. Um, and I, and I grew up football. That was my background. You know, I played college football, I played a couple years of arena football and you know, it's, it's funny because even coming into the CrossFit space, one of my closest friends in the space initially, his name is Tommy Hackenbrook. I don't know if you know Tommy or of Tommy, but he, um, <laughs> Tommy would be the guy that at the CrossFit games would intentionally have a beer after day one and then post it on social media. So the other competitors would see that he gives no Fs about what they think and what their recovery is. Yeah, and, he, yeah. and, and he was still going to go hand it to him in day two, right? Well yeah. fed on, on, on a double burger and, and a beer. Um, <laughs> so it's very interesting that, that we consider this lifestyle 
that we choose to live as CrossFitters because I believe now at the at the time where the sport is now, it's your I's have to be dotted, your T's have to be crossed, and it certainly involves so 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 much more than the hours that are spent in the in the gym, which are all obviously already countless. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it it certainly brings a lot to the table in regards to dis- discussing longevity even within our space. You know, we 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 were fortunate enough to watch Rich have the individual pursuit for for 5 years in a row. We of course know he won it 4 years consecutively, but then he even switched to go team because of those internal and external pressures that existed. It, it certainly wasn't because he wasn't fit. Yeah, we saw yeah. him do his thing on the team side and in fact I think in his latter years, we saw maybe Rich at his fittest. Yeah, um, I, even I really to, do think so, yeah. No doubt about it, right? So it's like, wow, that psychological stressor of being an individual is so high, it's just crazy. Same with Matt Fraser, right? We see him be dominant for the time, but really when we compare to other sports, we're like, man, that was, that was a pretty small window. Um, and I'm still kind of butthurt about the way he walked away because I was like, come on, man, you're going to retire the year after no one got to see you compete in person, mm-hmm. 2020? No, don't you take yeah. that from us. You know, I yeah, wanted him, yeah, I wanted him yeah. to come. One more year. Come yeah, yeah one, more, one more show in Madison is what I was hoping to see from him. But I think now where we're at in our space, of course, Tia's taking her break, doing her thing. Um, we've got, uh, doing her thing. She's, she's had a, <laughs> doing she her had mom a, thing. She had a baby. <laughs> And now we'll see kind of what it looks like for her. But I think about people like Annie, you know, who's been doing this for the longest of time, right? Yeah. 12 years as an individual, I think her 13th year um, competing at the games period, because of course she went team uh, just last year. And to me, it's like, and I don't know if you see this in her or other competitors, but there seems to be like this jovial childlike approach that she brings to the things that she does, where there's just like, no matter the pressure, there's just joy for Annie. It's like thinking back to two years ago, that snatch she hit. And in the bottom of the snatch, she legitimately is surprised and smiling. (laughs) Like what is happening as she stands it up? And I'm like, you know, I wish I had that. I wish part of me was wired that way because I'm so when I'm competing. Killer mode. Yeah, there's this cutthroat mentality that I I don't know if I can shake it. It's just kind of in my nature. But also I'll I'll, I'll say that maybe that was one of my limitations. Mm -hmm. I I do wonder if it's because she's just been there so many times, like maybe in her two first years that she was like kind of nose to the grind, but kind of, I feel like Noah Olsen this year at semis, did such a great job at just enjoying, enjoying it. I think he was on the rower and he was like waving to his wife or something. That's right. And it, and it wasn't from like a cocky standpoint. He was just like, you know what, this is probably my last season going as an individual and you better believe I'm going to, be smiling my whole way through it and really soaking it all in because it's really easy to just, it's a blink of an eye and all of a sudden semis is over or a blink of an eye and the games is over and now it's next season and Mm. um, all that work to just not really just enjoy it. And I think, you know, being around people that have that attitude is so contagious, but being around people that have a negative attitude is just as contagious. So I don't know. I think Noah would be one of those people that I would want to spend all day training with and you'd have a great time uh, while getting really fit. So that's kudos to him. Oh, no, absolutely. Yeah, he was just going to Noah Olsen this thing. There's no doubt about that. We, yeah. We've we seen his personality within this for many years, and um, he settled into a very comfortable version of himself, which is refreshing to see. I, he, I got to have him in an interview, too, um, before the semi semi season got rolling, and he shared a lot about that as he matured, you know, kind of in front of us uh, as he kind of grew up in the, in the space. So that was, that was cool to see him do that. Um, you know, I, it'd be remiss of me not to ask you exactly this, but how did you even get started in CrossFit? Because I don't know that we hit it yet. And I want to make sure that I get that story of like, how'd you walk into the doors to begin with? Yeah. So I played collegiate soccer and during the summers of college, we would work at University of Penn soccer camps. It would be girls from all over the country would Mm -hmm. come and just kind of help work the camps. Mm -hmm. And a girl from Marshall, um, she, her name's Emma Chapman. She was like, she had just graduated and just started CrossFit. So she was just coming back to work one more summer, but she's like, yeah, I just started this thing called CrossFit. I'm gonna go to the University of Penn gym because I have a little workout I need to do. Do you want to come do it? And I was like, well, I don't lift weights. Uh, I have to go to the track. And so I was like, sure, I'll go with you. And she was doing, I don't know, maybe back squats. And I watched. And then she had an EMOM of like, 
three kipping pull-ups every minute for 10 minutes. And she has a video of me trying to do it. I'll have to snag that from her. And I couldn't even get my chin close yes. to the bar. Um, but it was really fun because she kind of, I was so addicted just from that, that right when I graduated or right when I graduated, I was like, you know what, I'm going to do the running scene. And I kind of did the half marathon thing. And then I was like, I think I'm going to try that CrossFit thing that Emma did. And my first year qualifying as an individual, she also qualified as an individual in the central region, which was really cool. Um, she had a really great little career too. I think she was always pretty close to qualifying, but she did, she always had great open finishes, like a second place or something like that worldwide. But uh, it was just fun to see where we both had started and then kind of made it to there. But I walked into my first CrossFit gym and the workout was running and deadlifting and burpees or something like that. So perfect workout Killed for an it. athlete That's right. that doesn't know what they're doing. So it was really easy to be like, oh, I think I'm pretty good at this. I think I can kind of pursue it. And I just from there was in love. That's so cool. And where are you from originally? I'm from Philadelphia and well, Philadelphia moved to South Jersey, which is what people know as is like 10 seconds away yeah. and then kind of moved back over to Philly, back to South Jersey. So back and forth. Um, and that's kind of where I met uh, Kelsey and yep. we decided to go team down the, to a shore that was or a team that was from the shore. Um, that was when it was six person team, which is kind of crazy to think about six personalities on a team right now. Right. Um, yeah. So I didn't know how to do butterfly pull-ups like three weeks before regionals that year. And we somehow made games. Uh, but yeah, I was really grateful that I kind of got thrown in with the wolves and I just mm. had to quickly learn a lot of things. And I think I wouldn't have been, you know, as competitive so early on if it wasn't for that opportunity. That's awesome. That's yeah. awesome. So I got to imagine you're pretty much, you're, you're a pretty no nonsense young lady coming from Philly. I, I am from <laughs> yeah. a small town in central Pennsylvania. So I know how. Okay. Where at? Uh, it's it, the name of it is Huntington, Pennsylvania. Um, okay. it is, we're talking just a few miles from Amish, everything Lancaster like, stand, or something like that, <laughs> like standing at the bus stop, horse and buggy rides there by we go. <laughs> me in the morning type stuff. So yeah, I spent, That's spent weird. most of my childhood there and still much of my extended family still resides in central PA. So I know what the Philly crowd is like. There I know we go. How, my I Northeast know. people. That's right. That's right. Um, well, look, I know that you have got an amazing thing that you're training for here within the next seven weeks that you're going to take the the field and the floor for, which I can't wait to cover. So I'll be out there rooting for you and uh, awesome. seeing what you can do. But before I let you go, um, I've got five questions that I ask every guest that I have on. Okay. Um, so the first one is, what was your most memorable open workout? And can you describe it? My most memorable open workout was 2016, the toe to bar clean ladder um, oh yes fun and one. double unders it was my first true open and yep double unders and i made it to the last bar and i think i hit it four times and i think only a few girls that year did and it was when i was so brand new and i kind of got to the last bar like oh this is something did i cheat like it was one of those moments that i really thought oh i can start believing myself this is pretty cool so that's probably my favorite open workout Oh, that's amazing. And that's rare. Listen, so I got to say, most of the time people share the the instance from the open that was just like it buried them, right? Like oh, just completely yeah, yeah, buried yeah. them, right? I so have I so many of those, no, no, no. but I, yeah, yeah. I don't want to remember right. them. <laughs> no, let, let, let's sit here for a sec. So in, in, when you were doing that test then or that workout at the time, did you – were you like Friday Night Lights? Was there a big crowd or was it just you and a judge? Like what was the, what was the vibe? Yeah, it was – our whole team was doing it together. Um so they had all not made it to that last bar and it was a Friday night light setting. So it was just me, you know, so it got my whole crew. I think the last barbell, I was like, I had a pit crew, like they put a belt on me. Yeah. They changed my shoes for me. Um, so it was just great energy. Um, yeah. So that's definitely one of my top ones for sure. That's amazing. Um, and, and on a similar note, then what is, a more memorable moment outside of the open, just from competition as a whole within the CrossFit space throughout your years and why? My favorite moment. Is that what you said? Yeah. Most, most memorable, oh, most um, memorable. as a whole. So now we're not just focused on the open itself, but just, it could be semis, it could be regionals. It could be any, anything. Oh, that one's tough. It would probably be, 
maybe two. It would just be, I can't not say what just happened last weekend. Yeah. Like absolutely. I was, when I saw my face and Danny's face on the screen, I thought for sure it wasn't me. And I was already mentally preparing myself that they were about to say Danny's name. Mm. And when they said my name, like, obviously I broke down in tears and people were probably were like, whoa, she's so excited to make it, which I was, but I also was in such shock that it was me too. So that was probably the best feeling I ever had. Um, yeah, that would probably be, I would have to choose that. That was, uh, I, yeah, punch my ticket to the games in that in winning by two points or something was, I don't know if you can write a story better. Yeah, no, I, I seriously don't know that you can either. And it was quite the experience as I was there as everybody's names was being, you know, an- announced throughout the qualification process. So it was, there were, you could, it's crazy how quiet a packed arena gets at that moment. Oh, Right. Like yeah. it, it's nuts. It's absolutely nuts. And and I had nothing on the line, you know, neither of you are athletes that I work with necessarily or anything like that. And I remember like my armpits got sweaty. Uh-huh. Like, my, my hands uh-huh. are like cold. Like the adrenaline is just pumping for me. It's just, it's the excitement of the environment. So folks, yeah. that alone, if you haven't made it in person and you yeah. might've missed your chance this semi season next year, get you your schedule go. together. Yeah. You gotta go. It was, it was an amazing experience for everybody there. Um, question number three, uh, what is most likely playing over the speakers? If you're the DJ of your training session, what are you listening to? Uh, people probably hate me, but I am like <laughs> old school, dirty rap, DMX, Busta Rhymes. Anything that's just like raunchy rap music is what, what I listen to. That's, yeah. what, that's what I need going if it's like a quarterfinals workout. Yeah, I get it. So listen, if Kelly Baker is on <laughs> <Yeah>. the... <laughs> The speakers and DJ and the thing. Hide your kids. Hide yeah, your hide daughter. Your She's turning up the DMX, the Busta Rhymes. The I love it. I love it. Yeah. No, yeah. it's it, it gives a good vibe for training though, right? It gets your yeah, mind in a good headspace. Sure. Sometimes yeah. it's a little fun. I like that. You know, um, there's probably some cool memories from growing up tied oh, to some of those. For sure. You know, yeah. I, I, it's a, it's a whole vibe. I, I feel a similar way. Um, I love it. Question four. Now this is very different than DMX and the the raunchy rap. What type of impact would you hope to leave on the CrossFit community? Uh, probably if you work really hard, you can do anything. Mm. And that's something I really am excited that I get to show my kids. Maybe that's kind of the same realm of social media, which is a good side of it. Is I totally. have a lot of documentation that, but if you saw where I started in CrossFit, I you know, couldn't snatch a barbell. I had no history of gymnastics, none of it. And it obviously took some years, but if you just keep working at something like you really, it's like, even this year, I really proved myself, like there are no boundaries. Like what else can I do if I really put my mind to it, that I can be one of the best in the world at. And I think that's been pretty cool. Like I said, I don't have a background in pretty much any area of this sport and, you know, if you can make it a priority and dedicate your life to it for a year, well, I guess years, but uh, you can do anything. And that, that has been pretty cool. I love that. And, and I think it's a very, it's a very true thing. And I think that's a wonderful lesson to leave with the community and specifically those around you. You know, it's interesting because we'll, we'll all watch you, Kelly, and we'll assume that we know you. People will feel like they're very tied to you through social media, but no one is going to get, um, you know, the, the truth and the real vibe from your hard work and commitment other than, you know, your really close friends and family. So yeah. I think that'll be, a, that'll be certainly a great example. Um, okay. So the final question is if there's anyone in your life, you know, that you would love to see walk through the doors of a CrossFit gym, what would you say to them to persuade them to join a community or even just give CrossFit a try? If there's, am I telling you a specific person that I want to do that no, to, or what no. I would tell them? Yeah. What what would you say to someone who might be on the cusp of like, ah, I don't look like Kelly. I'm not as strong as Adrian. Like, I don't want to go to the games. So why would I even join CrossFit? Yeah. I would probably tell them that you're just, you'll find out more about yourself than you ever thought. Mm. And, you know, suffering in numbers is always way more fun than suffering alone. So uh, not even just the benefits physically, but you'll meet some really incredible people in our community that, I mean, I moved here from Philadelphia, not knowing anyone. And I have about a hundred people right now in my life that go to my gym that I think would drop anything if I needed something. And 
I don't know if you find that anywhere else. I don't know if there's any gym or any community really um, that not only that, the empathy that they have for me when they see a workout that I have to do, because it's really rare that the people that, you know, if you're professional in quote at your sport, that other people really know how tough it is. Mm -hmm. Um, But those people, you know, follow your journey, see what you do in and out. Um, So you get to be a part of that big, bigger picture. And yeah, I just, it's the most addicting sport in the world. And I think once someone just walks through the door and nothing's going to be easy, but pretty soon you'll get a little bit better at something and a little bit better at something. And you are going to start to look forward to some of those workouts and get a little bit competitive and see your body change. And it doesn't happen overnight, but it's the most non-judgmental place I've also ever been as well. So you kind of get welcomed with open arms of people that just want, you know, the best for you. And yeah, I, I think every person in the world should walk into a gym and leave the ego at the door and just be okay with, you know, we're all beginners and everyone started somewhere and uh, you'll meet some really incredible people along the way. Yeah. And, and I, and I love it. I think you, you hit the nail on the head and, to me, that's why we, we named this this podcast what we named it. It's more it's about more than fitness, yeah, right? Like, sure. it, like it really is. You, you think you walk into a gym and you're like, yo, like for me, it was like, hey, I want to compete. For others, it's like, hey, I want to lose a few pounds. And for others, it's like, hey, I want to I want to look better naked or whatever it is, right? Yeah, we all yeah, come yeah. in with different intentions. And then all of a sudden, we see that surrounding ourselves with humans that just want to be better versions of themselves makes us a better version of us. Yeah. And I think it's really powerful and really cool. Um well, Kelly, thank you so much for your time. This has been awesome. Um, I didn't know a ton about you prior to sitting down to have this interview, but you certainly gained yourself another fan over here. Oh, appreciate um, you. And I'm sure a lot of our audience will relate to that. So with that being said, where's the best place for these folks to follow along your journey or or learn more about what you do coaching wise and all those cool things you got going on? Yeah. So on Instagram, it's pretty easy. I'm just Kelly Baker 928 um, and I work with Black Iron Nutrition. Unfortunately, I have a wait list right now because my uh, life is kind of centered around CrossFit. But, you know, after the season, it'll probably open up. But, yeah, easiest way to find me would probably just be through Instagram and you can learn a little bit more about me there. Awesome. Folks, if you're dying to work with Kelly, get on that wait list. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thanks so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I'll see you in Madison. That's right. Absolutely. I will be out there. Hopefully we can touch base, but good yeah. luck. Uh, have fun and stay healthy throughout the summer. Uh, I'm sure you're going to enjoy every moment of getting ready for Madison. It's certainly going to be a great time when you get out there. That's for sure. For sure. Thanks, Adrian. All right. Thanks folks for joining us. Okay. This has been another episode of more than fitness.